Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this uh, afternoon session of the Maximum Symposium. My name is Christian Schori. I'm a project manager at the Olia Switzerland in Neuchâtel, Switzerland. And together with Shaq, um, we will present the progress within the Maximal project on uh, a microfabricated atomic clock for industrial applications. So uh, at Aurelia, we have been a group. So we see the names involved in the work at Aurelia. It's essentially all R&D uh, group at Aurelia. And um, our company is a global leader in uh, resilient PNT solutions. PNT is positioning, navigation, and timing solutions. And at Aurelia Switzerland, our specialty, our uh, expertise is in the T, the timing solutions. So we are um, fabricating and distributing atomic clocks for precise timing uh, to uh, our clients. In Neuchâtel, on the fabrication side, you see here on this slide a series of photos. Um, on the lower half here to the right, you see our industrial clock uh, fabrication facilities. Uh, just a comment. We have some issue... Uh with our computer, and somehow you will get some black screen sometimes. I hope this will not be the case too many times, but uh, now we see it again, so you can continue, <laughs> Christian. As I was saying, at the lower right half uh, of the slide, you see some uh, photos from our fabrication facility in Neuchâtel, uh, Switzerland, uh, for industrial clocks. We also have some labs for testing uh, these uh, clocks, we have some aging on the upper left-hand uh, corner. We, we have to age the, the clocks before they go out to the client. We need to do some temperature cycling on the right-hand side here. And you also see two photos of uh, our fabrication facilities for space atomic clocks, uh, in particular rubidium atomic clocks here. So with, um, with these facilities for uh, production, we, um, we fabricate a range of uh, products for our portfolio, shown on the next slide. We have uh, on the right-hand side uh, whole systems, that's typically GPS, uh, disciplined uh, atomic clocks, and our sister company T4 Science produces large hydrogen masers, active hydrogen masers for astronomical applications, very large uh, band uh, VBLI, long baseline interferometry. And when you go to the left, you see our components, uh, uh, products in our portfolio. We have, as mentioned before, the space clocks, uh, the rubidium atomic frequency standards, and the hydrogen mesas, which we deliver to the European Space Agency, ESA. And they go on the navigation satellites uh, for the Galileo system. On this talk today, uh, we will be focusing on uh, the MRO atomic clock in our portfolio. It's the one in the blue circle on the left hand. And uh, this is our smallest clock uh, in the portfolio. It's, it's the one that we will try. We have been studying in the Maximal uh, project how to improve the size, the performance, and the power consumption of this clock. Uh, on the right-hand side here, you see uh, the MRO atomic clock again. It's uh, roughly uh, 50 by 50 millimeters. And we can use this clock to recall briefly the principle, operating principle of an atomic clock. So in one sentence, an atomic clock is a crystal oscillator that is disciplined to a very stable, ultra-stable atomic system. And uh, to, uh, to recall this, this uh, functioning, in the blue diagram on the lower side, we have the servo loop. And uh, let's take a tour in the servo loop and see uh, how, how uh, the, the atomic clock works. On the... Um, pink box, the, the, uh, the violet box on the lower right-hand side, you see the crystal oscillator and giving the output to the client. If you go to the left, and let me just remind you that if you look at the, the MRO to the right, the, you see the, uh, the violet box. This is a small temperature compensated crystal oscillator, small component of our PCB board. And when you go through the servo loop, the uh, crystal oscillator is face locked to a gigahertz oscillator. That's the uh, light blue box on the, uh, on the MRO. And the gigahertz oscillator VCO is injected into the physics package, which is inside this orange box on the MRO. 
That physics package generates an error signal. It's a correction signal that you see in the server loop. And that uh, correction signal is used to discipline the crystal oscillator, giving an ultra-stable 10 megahertz uh, signal for the client. So let's take a look inside uh, the physics package, the orange box uh, on the MRO. This is inside this box is the, where we have done the, the most of the work. Um, and on the PCB electronics board, you see this is where we've done the most of the work within the Maximal project. So we have done an upgrade from the left to the right, taking first the upgrade on the physics package. Um, we use today a glass blown cell. So it's classical fabrication technology for, for, the, uh, for the vapor cell. And as we, as we saw this morning, a, a big part of the uh, maximal work has been on do, fabricating mem cells. And one of these mem cells was a mem cell for uh, our atomic clock. So uh, this has been integrated. We have replaced a uh, gigahertz antenna with some gigahertz modulation of, of, the, uh, of the laser. That's, we've changed the interrogation uh, uh, form of the atomic clock. And when you look on the lower part of the slide, we've also done an upgrade of the electronics package at Aurolia. We've integrated a new uh, microcontroller, uh, and we've added some additional servo loops for controlling different optical, uh, sorry, uh, controlling different parameters of the optical clock, such as microwave power and optical power. Finally, we have, uh, we have improved the locking of, of the laser. Okay, so at this point, I will give the word to Jacques, who will talk about the physics package developed at CSCM for this uh, new atomic clock uh, is on the upper right hand. Thanks, Christian. So I'm going to the next slides and uh, showing the, the development we made at CSCM for Aurolia. So as Christian said, to be able to integrate our platform uh, physics package into the MRO50. So this work has been done uh, in collaboration with David Agrasani, Laurent Ballet, Olivia Hefti, Sylvain Carlen, Fabien Dro, myself, and Steve Lecomte from the laser and quantum group at CSEM. So as you might have heard this morning, or if you were not here, CSEM is a research and technology organization based in Neuchâtel. And uh, the group of Steve Lecomte on laser quantum tech uh, has also an activity dedicated to atomic clocks. So uh, the motivation that brought us uh, to work uh, hand in hand with Aurolia was first the evaluation of the potential of this MEMS atomic vapor cell. As Christian said, the, the MRO50 is based on glass blowing techniques and the performance of this clock are exceptionally good in comparison to what can, you can find on the market. <clears throat> and these uh, performances, they are really uh, depending on the quality of the, this glass blown cell. And the idea was to replace that with MEMS if and only if we reach the requirements in, mainly in drift performance and a lifetime uh, with these atomic vapor cells fabricated with MEMS techniques. So the first uh, things to do in the, in the project was to deliver three of these atomic vapor cells and to integrate them in uh, modified MRO50 and to look at the performances. And as, as you see on this graph, so there are three cells, blue, uh, red, and black. What you see on, on the x-axis are the days of measurements and on the y-axis, the relative frequency fluctuations. And you see that in the first <clears throat> days, the frequency of uh, let's say the clock, but which depends really on the, on the cell itself, uh, is changing quite a lot, so there are a lot of drifts. And this average down uh, with time, so the, somehow the, the cell gets to an equilibrium uh, state where it drifts in, about, uh, in a very low level, and the target was to be uh, below 1, 10 to the minus 11 per day, and what we could show with this graph is that we are, for all cells, down less than 5, 10 to the minus 12. This was after 400 days. We continued the, the measurements uh, until about 800 days now. 
And for the two cells, black and, and red, we are even down to less than 210 to the minus 12. So we are really in the requirements. And this allowed us to say, OK, let's go now with the physics package to integrate these cells and then to integrate the physics package in the clock, uh, replacing the, the physics package, which is based on glass uh, blown cells. Um, this is what is explained here. So you have on the left hand side the, the MRO50 from Aurelia, and on the right hand side you have uh, uh, the, the results of a previous work which was done with the European Space Agency and with VTT. This was our first demonstrator of uh, low uh, flat form fractal miniature atomic clock. And uh, the work was to modify it and to adapt it so that it fits in this commercial uh, metallic DIL-14 package. Here you see uh, what we developed in, uh, in Maximal. On the left-hand side, you have the whole clock, uh, which is bigger than the, the MRO50, but it's a test bed that allows to see um, the modification that Aurelia had to do on the electronics to implement the CPT uh, interrogation instead of the double resonance interrogation of the MRO50. And on the right-hand side, you have a, a detailed view of the physics package. So we start with the DIL-14 base, <clears throat> then we have some PCV, then we have the coil. Uh, in the center of the clock, you have the atomic vapor cell. And uh, in order to insulate the vapor cell from the envi environment and so to decrease the power consumption uh, of the heating of the cell, uh, the cell is mounted on uh, what we call an isostatic holder, which has uh, bridges that allows for high thermal resistance. Then we have some optical parts, so we have the photodiode, we have the laser, and we have also a quarter wave plate. And on the top, just below the the cover, we have the waveguide, and this is really the, the way we obtained a very flat form factor, is to use a waveguide instead of stacking all the elements. So the standard way of doing is you have the, the laser, and then you have some spacer, you have optics, and then the cell, and at the top, the photodiode. But this makes that the physics package is at least 15, 16 millimeter in height. And with this approach, where we guide the light inside the waveguide, we could reduce the, the height of the physics package only the, without the deal to something lower than uh, five millimeters. The overall, uh, with the, the, the cover and so on, it's, it's about uh, 11 or 12 millimeters. Here you see the same... Uh, a view that we saw just before, but with the real components on the right side. Again, you, you see the, the different components, and they were all uh, fabricated either within the project uh, at CSCM, so for the waveguide, for the Vixel heater, for the, um, the cell. This was all done inside, uh, internally at CSCM. The other parts were obtained off the shelf, like the DIL-14, the photodiode, and the laser. One comment on the laser, this is still an uh, international provider of the Vixel. We have no provider in Europe for the time being. In the project, we assembled 10 physics packages together with VTT. So uh, you see them here. You see on the, on the top part the 10 uh, optics uh, units where you have the waveguide and the wave plate and the spacer. And uh, on the right, you see the, the 10 uh, physics package which were delivered to, uh, to our partner Aurelia. And on the bottom, you see some details like the Vixel unit and the, on the right side, the cell. The particularity of the cell has uh, this heating element. This is the uh, round shaped uh, green part, uh, which is wire bonded. This is used uh, as a thermal resistance to heat the cell up to 90, 100 degrees C. What you see also on this cell are these small dots, and these small dots is also a, a patented feature of these uh, cells. Uh, we have to avoid uh, rubidium droplets within the, the laser beam, 
And uh, this happens in this cell if, because you cannot do a, a tumor gradient. And so uh, we developed and patented these gold micro disks. These are the small dots. And with that, we can force the rubidium to condensate on, this, on these dots, which makes that the, there is a clear aperture which is free of any rubidium droplet at the center of the cell. <clears throat> uh, so once assembled, uh, we tested these physics packages on a dedicated test bed. That's what you see on the left. Uh, this is a simple PCB where we have at, in the center the physics package, which is surrounded by a magnetic shielding. And on the PCB, we just have a low noise amplifier. So that this is for pre-amplifying the, the photodiode signals that we get out of the, the physics package. And the remaining parts of the control uh, is not on a, on a PCB. It's uh, what you see on the right side. It's a full rack of instruments that allow us to make, uh, first of all, the optimization of the parameters, but really to drive the full clock. And you will see afterwards, then, this is used to make a pre, um, pre-validation of the physics packages, which are then transferred to Aurolia for integration on the PCB where all the electronics is uh, included. You see also on this picture a vacuum chamber, and uh, for the time being, the physics packages are not vacuum encapsulated, so we put the, the whole test bed that you see on the left part within the vacuum chamber so we can simulate the power consumption of the clock in vacuum. <clears throat> These are the first results we got. So uh, it worked from the first uh, part that we assembled. We put that on the vacuum chamber, control electronics, and everything was working right from the beginning. So we did the things pretty good. So the, the, pra the parameters for the, this clock um, <clears throat> our temperature of the cell of 95 degrees C, a laser power of 140 microwatts uh, at the output of the laser. Uh, we have a magnetic field which is about 300 milligauss and the RF power of minus 4 dBm. This really depends on how the RF is coupled to the, to the physics package. And uh, the overall power consumption of the physics packages is only 30 milliwatts in vacuum. And this is also uh, a target that we had at the beginning of the project, is to be somehow between 30 and 40 milliwatts for the physics package only. Knowing that the cell is heated at 95 degrees C and the laser at about 70 degrees C. And uh, so you see on the lower parts, uh, the modulated absorption spectrum. So as said Christian, it's a CPT mode. So we modulate the laser directly, which creates sidebands. And this is the resulting absorption spectrum. We lock the laser <clears throat> on, the, um, on the central peak. And then uh, we sweep the RF and we get a very nice CPT signal, which, is, which has a line width of about three kilohertz and a contrast of 1.7%. And this defines the uh, short-term frequency stability of the clock. Then we made some optimization uh, in terms of cell temperature, in terms of laser power, in terms of hour power that we inject in the laser, and also on the magnitude of the magnetic field. You see the different sweet spots that we identified, and these were identified to favorize the long-term stability and not the short-term frequency stability because the goal of a clock is to be good on the long-term, but also not bad on the short-term. It's kind of a compromise. Uh, here you see what, what is uh, needed for having a good short-term. Somehow it's a figure of merit, and uh, this depends all on the parameters that you, you define for the clock. And uh, as I said before, uh, these blue points, the, which are the optimized parameters, are meant for long-term frequency stability. Once this was optimized, so we measured the first uh, uh, frequency stability with our clock. Uh, we had to change the temperature. As I said this was optimization, so the cell temperature was decreased to 82.5 degrees C. This is to minimize the, the temperature sensitiv sensitivity of the clock. If I come back uh, to this uh, slide here, 
in the top left graph, uh, which shows the, the flat or the top of this uh, parabolic shape uh, dependence on the temperature of the cell. And we see that we are on the flat surface at 82.5 degrees C, which was the setup or the set point for the cell temperature. <clears throat> The laser power was also decreased a little bit, the magnetic field also, and the RF power was kept to the minus four. And what we get is uh, um, short-term frequency stability on the order of four, five, 10 to the minus 11, knowing that the uh, requirements was to be below two, 10 to the minus 10, so we are well below the requirements. For the long term, uh, these are the first measurements, so that the cell was not aged, so somehow there is some drift, as you've seen in the graph in the beginning. The cell, <clears throat> they need some time to age until they reach the low uh, drift performances. But still, with this first measurement, we could show that uh, we are not so far from the specification, even for long term. So the long term is about 10 to the minus 11 at one day. One day is just before, it's in about the last point that you see on the graph. It's a bit after that, it's uh, 86,000 seconds. But we are, for the first measurements, not so far from that. And with these results, we said, okay, uh, things are going well. Let's transfer that to, to, the, to our partner. So from here, we go to there, and I give the words back to uh, Christian that uh, integrated the physics packages in the electronics. Thank you, Jacques. And uh, once we received the uh, physics package uh, from CCM, we, uh, let me just take the next slide here. We inserted it into a vacuum chamber for tests. This is what you see on the photograph on the left. You see the vacuum chamber and you see the complete uh, maximal clock with this physics package from CSCM integrated, pumped down to a few 10 to minus six millibars in the vacuum chamber. And on the footer to the right, uh, you see our software that we use to uh, control the clock parameters and obtain the uh, frequency telemetry data and clock uh, telemetry data. So in this configuration, um, we optimize the clock parameters. So I'll just go back a slide. So uh, as you've already seen uh, on the slides uh, from Jacques, we first looked at the modulation of the Vixel at the 3.4 gigahertz, and we found that its optimal operating parameters was at minus five dBm, which is very close to the parameters found at CCM minus four dBm. On the right, you see uh, in blue the clock error signal. That's the error signal that we use to discipline the 10 megahertz quartz crystal, as I explained on the first slides. And to, to obtain this error signal, we had the optimal parameters. We used the modulation rate uh, of the uh, CVT resonance signal at 104 hertz and the modulation depth of the plus minus 300 hertz. So coming back to this slide, uh, in operation, we measure a power consumption of the clock uh, around 265 milliwatts. This is five volts uh, and uh, 53 milliamps uh, of uh, consumption at ambient temperature on the vacuum. So this is, this is quite good. It's a, a small improvement compared to our MO clock, which is more running at 350 milliwatts. And uh, in this configuration, we then uh, tried to look at what stability we could measure at Aurolia. Uh, and the frequency uh, stability we, you, you see on the lower left graph, it's the fractional frequency fluctuations of the uh, maximal clock measured against a stable hydrogen maser. The data shows uh, 3.5 days of uh, data taking with a sampling time of one second. When we look at uh, the uh, statistics of these uh, fluctuations, that means we calculate the Allen deviation on the right hand side, we find a short term frequency stability of uh, roughly 5, 10 to minus 11 at one second that integrates down as time, tau, tau minus one half between one and 100 seconds, that's due to the wide FM noise of the uh, CPT uh, clock signal. And beyond 100 hertz, we have uh, a flicker flow around a few seven, uh, 10 to minus 12, when we remove the drift from the data. And the drift that you see on the left-hand side, if you draw a, a line on this frequency data, you will find roughly three, 10 to minus 11 uh, per day in uh, fractional frequency drift. 
And that, as again as discussed uh, in, in very in, in detail by Thomas this morning and uh, by Jacques just before, um, is an aging that we expect to go down over time. So if we run this clock uh, for uh, three to six months, this number should come down in the 10 to minus 12 per day. So to come to the last slide on conclusion, uh, CSCM and VTT delivered the five physics package uh, with uh, micropropagated MEMS cells uh, to allow Aurolia for the first time to test uh, an atomic clock uh, at our facility using a micropropagated uh, physics package with a MEMS cell. We had uh, all five clock units uh, operating uh, nominally with one uni unit failing uh, uh, due to a simple uh, mistake of uh, operation. We at Aurolia needed to do some update of our firmware, microcontroller firmware, to introduce some new clock functionality for CPT interrogation of the clock. We developed a graphical user interface for uh, monitoring clock uh, parameters and record uh, clock telemetry. The frequency stability that we obtained is very good. It's uh, not far from our MRO atomic clock, which is on the market today. So we. Uh, we look very positively on these results and uh, hope that we can drive down the size and the power consumption even further in, uh, in the post-maximal uh, project. So uh, with these final remarks, I thank you for your attention from Aurelia's side, CMCM side, and I open the floor for questions. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, for the timing, there was one question on the chat, which is... Uh, for me, or you can answer if you want. Uh, what is the size of the mem cell? So the mem cell is uh, four by four millimeter, and the uh, optical uh, pass is 1.5 millimeter. Uh, that would be the only question that we have on the chat. I don't know if there are questions from the audience. Anyhow, we have uh, from time constraints the next uh, speaker, Christophe, and uh, perhaps one. Single question, if you can already perhaps move the, and take the, the microphone, the Christoph. So are the cells also with RBN3? Why is the physics package filled with xenon? So uh, yes, the cells, they are filled with rhodium uh, uh, azide, so RBN3. This is our standard way of fabrication. And the physics package is currently filled with xenon for reducing the power consumption before uh, achieving the vacuum encapsulation which, that we still didn't succeed completely. That's why we use Xenon. And uh, a very last one. Uh, do you have long-term measurements over the five or four other integrated clocks? Um, for the timing, if I'm not wrong, there is only one which has been integrated or uh, for the long term, and the other ones were tested, but not for the long term. This is for the, the current status. Okay, with that, uh, I give the floor, and so I would like to thank Christian for the nice presentation. Thank you very much, and uh, for the questions also. And now uh, Christophe will uh, speak about the, uh, the developments they did on the, the other type of clocks in the Maximal project. Yes, exactly. Welcome back and good afternoon. So uh, the title of my talk is Enhanced Microcell Atomic Clock based on Pulse Double Resonance Ramsey Interrogation. And this work was done mainly at the University of Neuchâtel with some contributions from EPFL partners on the microwave resonator. So uh, after first introduction, I will show you the setup that we used, uh, show you the results on the clock operation we had and draw some conclusions on the next steps. So the motivation for this work is that uh, chip scale atomic clocks about which we were dealing in the Maximal project, they are uh, partly already commercial products. As you can see there, the first one that came out was from Microsemi, the CSAC, and typical stabilities there are on the order of 10 to the minus 10 at one second and 10 to the minus 11 at one day. And there's two main technologies. There's the cohesion population uh, trapping approach that uh, CSEM has implemented in their physics package. And there's also the continuous wave optical microwave double resonance approach that uh, uh, Aurolia used in their MRO uh, clock that they had developed. 
And uh, actually, both of these approaches, they are quite limited by light shift effects, what concerns the clock stability, and particularly on the long-term time scales. However, in high performance, uh, so centimeter scale vapor cell clocks, the light shifts are usually suppressed when you move to Ramsey double resonance operation, as it's also done in, in the primary uh, atomic fountain clocks. So in our study, uh, we were looking at the question to apply double resonance Ramsey pulse schemes to a microcell clock, so based on the microcell you see on the lower right-hand side, and this is actually sitting on a one euro cent coin. And so, uh, and below you see a microfabricated uh, PCB-based microwave resonator we've been using for this. And so, so we combine these two elements and then we make a clock out of it and we want to determine the light shift contributions, establish a first long-term stability budget for this type of clock and uh, see if, and demonstrate actually that with this we can really do improved cell clocks. So, short introduction on uh, Ramsey operation of a clock. To the right-hand side, you can see the rubidium uh, level scheme that is relevant in this extent, and you can see that in the ground state, we have these two F equals one and F equals two levels that uh, constitute the clock transition in the microwave regime. And in order to detect them, we need this red light, this red arrow light at 780 nanometers on the rubidium D2 line, in with which we use to do optical pumping of the ground state. Now, usually this is left on in continuous mode, but in the Ramsey scheme, sorry, other were you? In the uh, Ramsey scheme, we use two uh, pi microwave pulses that you can see in the time scale to the lower left. We have first a strong light pulse, then we switch off the light, then we have two microwave pulses separated by Ramsey time, and then we have weak optical pump pulse again. In this way, we don't have any light during the microwave interrogation, and we reduce the light shifts. However, we cannot choose the uh, Ramsey time, the TR, or the cycle length arbitrarily short, which would be interesting to do, but it would, will be limited by realization rates in our cell. So in this way, we can interrogate the atoms, and what we get as a typical signal as a function of frequencies, you see in the lower right-hand corner, where we get a nice typical Ramsey fringe pattern that we expect for this type of clock. Now, the setup we use is uh, what, what it was a pre-existing physics packet that we had already available. So you see the micro cell that's sitting down there. We have the microwave printed resonator. And all this is contained in this uh, brass enclosure to shield simply off the microwave. So this is quite low volume. So we have roughly 0.3 cubic centimeter vapor cell uh, operated at 99 degrees Celsius, and this corresponds to roughly 10 to the 11 rubidium atoms, and of course we have a buffer gas in this cell again. So when we put this into our setup, you see on the lower right-hand corner in the shaded green area, we have this physics package where we also have applied magnetic shields and uh, field coils. And then we use a pulsed uh, frequency-stabilized laser source that you see on the left in the yellow housing, and we pulse the light using an acoustic-optic modulator, the AOM. And everything is sitting in a double-layer uh, magnetic shielding, and then we can apply with the, our control electronics, we can control the laser, the AOM, and the microwave, and close the clock loop to stabilize the quartz as Christian had introduced. So if we look then at the fringes of our clock, uh, you see down in the left-hand corner uh, a plot with the typical Ramsey fringes after optimization, and there we obtain contrast on the order of 6.7% at a line width of 1.4 kilohertz. So just to put this into relation with the optimized uh, CPT clock we had heard about, that's about five times more contrast. That's quite expected for double resonance in uh, contrast to CPT, and we have half the line width roughly. Now, we cannot choose the, we, in principle, as you can see there from the formula, the, the line width scales inversely with the Ramsey time TR. So in principle, we should simply make the cycle longer, wait longer between the microwave pulses and get much more narrower line fringe widths and thus better uh, frequency resolution. However, that's not possible because in our cell, we have relaxations and we have the, uh, at that limit the useful Ramsey times and they were measured as five to four kilohertz respectively in in our cells, and this is about 10 times faster than in the centimeter scale, and so we need also to limit our the Ramsey times to these durations, and to give you an impression about the cycle speed, 
uh, I indicated here in the lower right-hand corner, and we have pumping times and detection times of 200 microseconds, and Ramsey time is actually set to 290 microseconds in, uh, in this uh, experiment, so our total cycle time is just below one millisecond. And if we look at the clock stability that we can obtain with this, so the black dots show you the clock stability in Ramsey mode, uh, as we measured for these experiments. The red data is the same clock operated in continuous wave operation, and the blue line gives you the stability of the micro semi commercial CSAC clock just as a benchmark unit. And what you can see is that uh, the stability is roughly 10 to the minus 11 at one second. It goes down well below the 10 to the minus 12 level at around uh, 1,000 seconds integration time. And at one day, so 10 to the 5 seconds, we are on the level of 2, 10 to the minus 12. And uh, this is uh, really a one order of magnitude improvement compared to the uh, CW operation and quite a nice result. So let's look a little bit into detail. Of course, we can analyze the short-term stability of our clock, and it has several contributions. We have one contribution, which is the sigma SNR, the first term in the, under the square root. And this is mainly given by the contrast, uh, line width, and, uh, and the detection noise of our clock. And then we have a Dick effect contribution, which stems from the uh, phase noise of our quartz oscillator that we uh, slave to the atomic reference. And then we have systematic shifts due to the light shift, which are the last term. And then if you look down, and we can all calculate them, and we have some uh, sync type, uh, some uh, expressions to calculate these different contributions. And if you do look down at the, the table of the different uh, stability, uh, instability contributions at one second, so there we have the signal-to-noise ratio, the SNR, which really dominates uh, uh, the, stability, uh, the limitation of the stability. And in second place comes the Dick effect, while the light shift effects are really not relevant for all of this. And this nicely explains the stability we observe. And on the right-hand side, you can see how this develops with the Ramsey time. And you can see the further we crank up the Ramsey time in order to make the signal narrower, However, we lose on the RIN, so on the signal-to-noise detection, this is the red line, this the, uh, limit really goes up. So the best point where we were working was just around the 290 microseconds I had mentioned. Now let's look at the long-term stability. If we want to express the long-term stability in terms of L deviation, the sigma, we ha can have the sum of squares of the stability due to individual effects. And this can be calculated at this delta Y over delta AI, where AI is one individual parameter of the clock operation, for example, the light intensity. And the sigma AI would then be the fluctuation of this parameter, so the, uh, for example, light intensity fluctuation at a given time scale. And we consider several sources of instability, microwave power shift, so direction of the free clock frequency due to microwave power changes, temperature shifts due to the cell temperature, intensity light shift and frequency light shift due to the frequency and intensity fluctuations of the laser diode pump light. And we measured these sensitivities, the delta Y over delta AI that you see in the formula for all these parameters and of course their stabilities. So we get these results, uh, a coefficient for variations of microwave power here. We get a coefficient, or rather a dependence, uh, for the cell temperature. And there, this inverse parabola is a clear indication of the buffer gas mixture we use in our clock. And actually, we were operating a little bit off the uh, optimized point, but you will see that this is not a big limitation for us. We also measured the uh, coefficients with respect to the light shifts, and here you see that we have quite some error bars on the frequency, but this is simply due to the fact that our stability at one second is quite limited. And so from this we inferred the coefficients we use that are rather upper limits because we take into consideration these error bars of a measurement. From this then, <coughs> we uh, can, can consider what is the uh, uh, long-term stability budget that we establish here at 10 to the 4 seconds, if you took a look at the table to the right. And we can see that the dominant contribution there is, uh, is the microwave power shift uh, at this moment at 3, 10 to the minus 13, at 10 to the 4 seconds. 
and followed by intensity light shifts on the level of 1.6, 10 to the minus 13. Frequency light shifts are far below, and the temperature shift only accounts to 1, 10 to the minus 14 at this level, so actually it is completely out of the plot of the stability plot that you see on the left-hand side. On that stability plot, you see the clock performance in black, and you can see the contribution from the main microwave power shift in red. If we make the sum, uh, we see the wet total measurements. Uh, uh, we, the total amounts to 3, 10 to the minus 13 then, but we measure 8, 10 to the minus 13, so there's still one contributor that we did not fully identify, and our best guess at this moment is that this is the stability of the laser beam pointing because we're having quite an exploded setup on, the, on our optics tables, and uh, we have seen some indication that th this reacts to environmental conditions, and that can be reduced in a more miniaturized setup or encapsulation. So as a conclusion, I want to tell you that we have demonstrated the Ramsey clock operation using a rubidium microcell with obtaining uh, 10 to the minus 12 level stability at one day on the long time scales. The light shift is strongly reduced and is not a limitation to this clock performance, uh, to this clock operation. And the mid and long term performances could be improved compared to the CW case by one order of magnitude. And we believe that there is a good potential to further reduce the stability into the few 10 to the minus 13 range and some uh, still missing long term stability contribution is under study. And with this, we think the next steps will be to stabilize the microwave uh, power in order to get this uh, microwave power shift under control and to operate the clock in a controlled atmosphere. And with this, we think we have identified a good candidate to improve further on the stability of, of miniature atomic clocks. So thank you for your attention. Many thanks, Christoph. The question, we have one question from Ilya. Which exact exact AOM has been used, if you can say that. Oh, it was uh, nothing particular. It's sort of an off-the-shelf component. Uh, I think it was one that has been around in the lab for quite some time. Uh, uh, I don't remember the brand yet, so sorry. But it was standard. Are there other questions? From the audience, some questions? Yeah, so I think uh, all the optics uh, here is in free space. So yes. my, my question is uh, if someone in your community started to like look at integrated photonics uh, and uh, even maybe the atomic part to maybe improve the stability or if you think that some integrated component and optics could improve the stability of these clocks. Yes, so our, in, in this study we really used free space laboratory optics uh, in order to first determine what is the potential of this approach. And I think we have the answer to this question now. There is a good potential and it's worthwhile to look into this question. And of course, now the question is how to replace a bulky uh, free space acousto-optic modulator w by some other switch integrated photonics or whatsoever in order to make it compatible with miniature atomic clocks. That's definitely one of the next questions, but we don't have a, a clear answer to this yet. Thank you very much, Christoph.